How old or what kind? Uh, she's a husky mix. Wow. And is this first time dog ownership? Uh, first time dog ownership with family members. Wow. Very, very cool. So you're up for sleepless nights and all oh, of those really things that come with it. Good yeah. deal. Well, that's, that is very, very cool. So you have to go a long way to pick, pick him or her up? Keep letting us know how it is. Very cool. What time? Uh, right after this class. So there's a, stay focused. I mean, good things, yeah. great things are going to happen in this class, but there will oh, be yeah. fun things yeah. coming up forward. So, yeah. Maddie, anything with you happening today, exciting or otherwise? No? no? Just business as usual? You did not get the panini. I did not, no. The line was too long. There we go. But you got tater tots. That is a good thing. Well, welcome everybody. Happy Thursday. Beautiful day. Uh, I am super excited about today's class because we get to bring in outside spectacular knowledge into the classroom. I'm going to introduce our guest speaker in just a moment. But I uh, really am thankful for all of you. And I just want to start out in a word of prayer for uh, Professor Johnson, who I think everybody may have seen the, the letter of he's been diagnosed with cancer, kind of a rare form of cancer. And he's actually at his consult today. Uh, with his oncologist on what are the next steps. Um, so if we just want to lift him up in prayer of um, having walked through that, it's not the easiest thing in the world, but he's in good care, good spirits, and uh, we can help him by surrounding him with prayer. So join me in prayer, and then uh, we'll get into our class. Father God, thank you for being our great physician. Thank you for being a God who knows all things, every hair on our head, and has written every one of our days before we were as yet anything. And we praise you, Lord, for... Uh, Professor Johnson and his wife Debbie. Uh, you know what's going on with uh, Professor Johnson's body. Uh, praise you for the early diagnosis and the care that he's able to receive and would pray for immediate healing. Uh, you can do anything, Lord, and we pray that you would heal him. Pray that you would also put the right care in front of him, Lord, so that uh, the cancer would be mitigated um, and that you would keep all pain and discomfort away from him and strengthen him. And be the lifter of their heads, Lord. May they keep their eyes fixed upon you, and may we be constant in prayer. Thank you for this class. Thank you for the students. Thank you for Chris Lindahl and his team being here today. And we give the class over to you, Lord. Help us to learn what you want us to see. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, as you guys know, I am a big believer in let's bring in real-world learning. Let's bring in people who are really good at what they do from the outside of texts and case studies and all of those things have their place of learning, but I don't think there's anything that can replace somebody who's actually doing it. And if you have traveled around anywhere with even half an eye open, you may have seen <laughs> somebody like this out there with welcoming arms and Chris Lindahl uh, open. And he is uh, what I call my principles of marketing class, and you guys have heard this, he's a marketeer extraordinaire. He knows how to communicate with people. He knows how to communicate what his point of difference is. And uh, it was a real blessing. Uh, Megan, uh, who's one of the, the team uh, teammates of Chris's, had contacted Northwestern many months ago saying, we'd love to partner with you. Is there a way to connect? I'm like, wow, this is Chris Lindahl. This is really cool. Reached out, had some conversations, and Chris is gracious enough to be with us today. So let's give him a warm consumer behavior round of applause and welcome. <laughs> Chris, thank you. Welcome. Thanks really for really being here. It. Yeah, thank you so much. This is really cool. As I say, I picture you up on the billboards, and like here you are, which is super cool. Um, and you know, background. We're going to start with a lot of different things, and I want you guys to ask questions as you go along because this is a learning opportunity. And you guys know, and probably see the heads go up and down. I can go on and on forever with questions. We're going, yeah, you can. I want you guys to be able to ask questions, so don't hesitate to shoot up or go, Donaldson. I have a question here, but. Chris, welcome. Why don't you tell us maybe just a yeah. little bit about yourself? You have a really interesting story before we get into consumer behavior marketing type things, but tell us a little bit about you. Well, I appreciate the invite, and, and for everyone here, it's an, an honor to spend time with all of you. I, uh, I always love having conversations about the journey, and, and uh, which is ongoing, by the way. You never get there. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to break the news to anyone. <laughs> We're still trying to figure it out ourselves. But so, so my background is I went to Frid Fridley High School. Um, and, and then after, uh, after high school, I went to uh, University uh, Mankato, right? So it's Minnesota State University Mankato. Graduated there with education degree. Um, had a couple of uh, jobs and experiences along the way and then got into real estate in May 2009, uh, which some would argue was sort of the bottom of, you know, the, the economy, the real estate industry. And I saw an opportunity to really uh, educate homeowners. The same way that I've always been driven, you know, it's what led me to the, the college degree that I have, was being a teacher, giving back, helping others. 
Um, and so, so 2009, I started, to, uh, January 2015, I started the Chris Lindahl team uh, at a national brokerage. We became the, the, top, the, the top team in the country. And then we, in May 2018, we started uh, independent real estate brokerage, Chris Lindahl Real Estate, which was uh, number five in the country last year, which is amazing. So um, that's like on the professional side, I, I have a 13-year-old daughter, uh, Victoria, um, so big soccer player, um, significant other, Gina. Um, and, and I think that the thing that I've learned along the way through all of this is that anything that you put out there, the more that it connects to who you are personally, the more lift you're gonna get. And so what you see today and, and, and what I share with you here is exactly who I am. Like this is how I live personally and professionally. And anytime that you put yourself out there any sort of marketing, people are gonna have a, you know, a feel, a story of who you are, what you are, it's like the telephone game of, you know, of, of life. But it, it, it doesn't feel like work when who you are personally is how you show up professionally. And when you can get to an alignment where you're actually doing what you were born to do and what you, your calling is, it, it, it makes a big difference and people can feel it, mm-hmm. right? And I, and I think that's the, that's the piece of, of, of why I came today. As I, I have a passion for this. You know, everyone here, it's, it, it sounds like you're, you're right on the verge of graduation. It's an advanced level marketing class. I'm excited to talk about any strategies, techniques, things that you're curious about, about our journey. Um, like I said, we don't, we don't have it all figured out. We've, you know, I think what we've done really well is we've really run towards um, learning opportunities or failures, maybe some people would call it, and we've, we've gathered data from that and, and we've been, we, we make ourselves better each and every day. Yeah. So we evolved really well. You know, you mentioned something which I think is really key too. Um, when you are who you are, when you're genuine, which I think in business circumstances, there can be that a pressure to go well conform to being this or that it's a lot more fun and it's a lot easier to do your job when you are who you are and you know recognizing your weaknesses playing to your strengths and being real and you're going it's not like you have to change yeah. as you go from one to the other this class is focused a lot on experience um, and one of the things that I've been researching the last couple of years and some of the consulting work that I had done in, in past years said, you know, if you look at what you do, the product or service, you obviously want to optimize this. And decades ago, when I was starting out, my corporate career was have the best features, have the best benefits, advertise a lot. And, and that, to me, is table stakes. The experience factor and how that can really change the value perception is what we're studying a lot, irregardless of what the business is. So as I look at the real estate business, you know, there are lots of real estate agents out there. And in a sense, I could say, well, all doing the same thing. What role does experience, and experience can be defined lots of different ways. There's not one cookie cutter, but how does experience play into what you do and differentiates yeah. you from others? Yeah, that's a, it's what we talk, I mean, I'm glad you asked questions, what we talk about every single day. We would not be where we are today based on what you've seen and heard from a marketing perspective from us. We wouldn't be. We are where we are because of the process and the experience. And just to give you a little context about what we've done in real estate and, and, and where we're headed, when I, joined, when I joined the first brokerage in 2009, what I noticed is that everyone was an individual real estate agent. Think about it in any in industry as a solopreneur, right? One person responsible for basically everything. Like almost like a company that's in startup phase, right? No budget, no resources. You know, it's, uh, they have to put in all the time, all the effort, and that's how real estate has been done from day one. A lot of people in the room watch today know someone that's a real estate agent. Likely, they're navigating this process in, in, in their professional career on their own, right? They have a broker, but the broker really doesn't play a, a, a factor in the experience that the customer is getting from them. And what I, what I found was this individual agent, and there's a lot of them that are amazing. So this is by no means is this meant to put anyone down. It's just a reality of what it is today. What I found was individual real estate agents couldn't do what a customer actually needed them to do. But the challenge was is customers didn't know what they needed because they only buy or sell a house, you know, on average seven to 10 years. Sometimes people, you know, live in their house for 30 plus years. And so they don't actually know what questions to ask. They don't know what the process should be. They don't even know what type of experience they want. And so what what we set out to do is let's give them the experience that they should get. Like they they we, uh, there are no consumers today that know what the real estate experience should be because they just don't do enough. 
Now, if you are doing your day-to-day -day job or like the way that you come here every single day, you know what you want the experience to be here on campus because you do it every day. If you came to campus once every 10 years, would you know what you want the experience to be? Unlikely, right? So it's, a, it's the same thing in real estate. So I saw an opportunity. How do we create a structured, streamlined process that creates convenience from beginning to end for a customer? That's easier said than done, right? We're not even there yet. We're doing everything we possibly can to make the experience better for all of our customers, but also all the employees, all the agents, everyone in our organization too. Because we, we, there's a lot of real estate agents that are in that solopreneur world that, are, that decide to join Chris Lindahl Real Estate because they don't want the stress. They don't want like, the loneliness of being on the journey alone. They don't want to take the risk, right? Risk is a big factor too, right? Because if you look at marketing, some people don't have the appetite that we did to go out and, and spend millions of dollars creating ads and marketing and building website, building house tech. Some people don't have that strong desire. So when you start to, to compound all of that together, you're, you're creating a team structure in an industry that has been a solo person forever. And to be able to create a streamlined approach in one of the most stressful transactions or things that people do in their life, such buying and selling houses, it's really hard, right? Every person that you work with, every family that you meet, everyone that, most people that sell real estate, they do it because of a life-changing event. They have, you know, they're expecting a child, like they're growing a family, they're downsizing, they're retiring, death, divorce, relocation. There's always something at play that creates this motivation for them to do something. And I, one last thing I wanna say on that, that process piece, and so when people look at, today where you know all the economic changes and the things that are changing in the industry and interest rates are obviously been on the rise. The thing that everyone needs to understand about an industry like real estate is that people will continue to buy and sell real estate because it's based around a life changing event, not around money, right? And the mistake that most people make is like, well, it just got more expensive. And I said, yeah, I understand that, it, that in some degree it did get more expensive for some, but also at the same time, when is your desire for your family, for your friends, for your lifestyle, going to supersede your desire to try to time the market perfectly? And this could be a conversation for the stock market, real estate, and so on. There's only so long that someone is wait, gonna, willing to wait because they're trying to time things right before the pain of not having that extra bedroom, by, by not being able to relocate to where they wanna go, not being able to retire. Like, all these other things that happen, a life change event changes that. And because there is, in, 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 in our eyes, because there is so much stress and because this matters so much because a personal thing, the customers deserve to have a process that is built around a team of specialists. Instead of one individual person trying to be all things to all people, which no one can do that, including me, right? I have things that I do really well and I have other things that are shortcomings I'm, I'm not very good at. I try to continue to improve on them, but some of them I just am not that good at. And when I was an individual agent, I, was, I would show up to an appointment and I'd have, to be, I'd have to put on this presentation, like more the front end marketing, that I was good at everything and no one is, right? And so, so the more that you can go in and have a conversation and say, hey, uh, as an agent, I'm, I'm backed by a team where we've created this streamlined approach, right? Where we're, we know we're gonna be able to deliver this for you, the customer, in the time of life-changing event, it's a powerful statement to make. And, and in marketing especially, you have to have some sort of guarantee that you're gonna deliver on that. And if you don't deliver on it, your marketing disconnects with the, with the consumer because they don't trust you. And if you don't have trust on the front end, at some point you won't be able to continue to do that because you won't have customers that are supporting you. And when you think about buying a house, which I'm assuming most of you have not done yet, but parents may have or people you know, just as Chris said, uh, there are, there's a reason why you're, you're buying the house. There's an incredible amount of stress that goes with it, even when you think you know all of the reasons. But I remember moving uh, from Louisville, Kentucky, out to Southern California uh, for a promotion, which was really exciting. I had never been west of the Mississippi, so knew nothing about California or the real estate, and my wife was expecting. So two really big life-changing events of moving, buying and selling homes and having a baby. I would not recommend doing them at the same time, personally. It was very stressful. Yeah. But what I would say, what you hit upon was, 
uh, you know, the ability for someone to understand what I was going through. Was I looking for a house and, you know, this kind of range and all that? Yes. But there were 10,000 other things that I didn't even really understand where you go, it made the difference between what was, you know, transactional or relational. So you talk about having a team of experts. What is the process? What kind of, t take us through, how do you gain that knowledge about what is somebody really experiencing and then how do you partition out all of those areas versus what was traditional, I think, when I was buying homes of one person tried to do it all. Right. So I think the thing, I mean, there's, I'll tell you right now, I mean, even at the level that we're at today, there's some luck along the way. Mm -hmm. Like standing up here saying that I, we had it all figured out and we made it all the right decisions and fi it's not true. I, there were a lot of things where we had some luck. One of them was that I was an individual agent and I became the number one agent in the state. Right, so, so that became a, actually an X factor of what we are today and where we're going. I didn't know it at the time, right? So that's where the little bit of the luck comes in. I, I worked hard, I was dedicated, like I showed up every day, like I did the right things. But as we grew and when we created the team in January of 2015, the advantage that we had, and back then when it, was, when it was just me then starting the team, I knew where the pain points were in the inefficiencies in the traditional real estate model because I had done it thousands of times. So creating and, and evaluating, like the conversation that John just mentioned, I've had that conversation with relocation and expecting and growing a family thousands of times, mm -hmm. right? So when you have that conversation and you go in and you're hearing the stress and the things that are going on in people's lives and you're realizing like, hey, there's a little bit of a disconnect to the way that this works as an individual agent, I lived it. Mm -hmm. And I think what you'll find along the way for all of you in your journey is that having a conversation with someone that is a founder of an organization is a different type of conversation if they wore in, in different shoes along the way, right? So if I come in, if I came in here today and I said, hey, I'm the CEO of Chris Lindahl Real Estate, I started one year ago, and they, and they hired me to take the business, grow the business, make it more efficient, whatever that may be, there's a skill set that I would have, of course, of, of why I'm taking the business to that level, making it more efficient, whatever the other things are that the business needs. But coming in here and saying, I started in 2009 with zero and, and, and worked my way through two brokerages and then created a team and then created uh, an individual, uh, independent brokerage is a very different experience. There's pluses to both. But one of the advantages that we have is when you're creating and innovating a space such as real estate, when you've already done it, it's a very different perspective than having, just like John, I mean, the experience that you have, I mean, you know, reading all the information and the places you've been, he can teach and instruct very differently because he's had a lot of experience in this space. If you brought someone in here that has no experience in marketing or branding or scaling or organizations or leadership or any of the other things that you guys hit on in this class, it's not gonna be the same feel, yeah. right? And it's, so it's the same thing for us that everything that we are doing right now is, the, is, is watching what was inefficient, not only just from my perspective as an individual agent, but also being inside of brokerages and watching other individual agents and the pain points that they shared every week and the things that they were unsure of. And it's like being here today. What I love about you know, coming to the university like this is that I get to learn from all of you too. The questions that you ask me today will make our company better down the road. Hey, here's what people in college that are just about to go, you know, just about to, to graduate are thinking about, about real estate about our company, about me, whatever it is, I take those things along. And I think the thing that really has separated me from the early days is my ability to take information in, right? And there's all kinds of different personality assessments that you may or may not have done. We're really big on a, on a lot of them and all of them tell you something a little bit different. Assessments are only a certain part of the picture, obviously. But one of my big ones is, is input, right? So I've got strategic, I've got vision input, like all the stuff that you say today, I will take with me and I will think through. Like, hey, how would this play in our company? How would this work? In, in all, and I look at every single thing that I hear, every single person that I talk to. And so when you take that information and you're doing the research first, you end up in a situation when you're innovating that it's not guessing, right? It's not guessing when I worked with 2,000 customers before I started the team. It would be if I said, hey, I'm getting into real estate tomorrow, I'm starting a real estate team, I have no background in real estate. I've never met with a customer at, at their house, at the kitchen table, but I'm confident that I can go buy marketing or leads and bring people in and charge some sort of compensation split structure and now I'm in business. Or I could go buy billboards, radio, whatever, and I have no idea how to, how to anything that happens in real estate. It's a, it's a big disconnect and you see 
businesses all the time. You see this commonly like in like serial entrepreneurs, right? Where the first business that they start was the one where they were the, sort of the founder and they, they took every step along the way. And then over time you see them try to start other businesses and rarely are the other businesses as successful as the first one because they, they just had way more information. That was their space. I'm not saying that they, that a serial entrepreneur can't go find someone that is the expert of that in another business and it has massive success because that happens all the time, right? It, it does. But just being able to, to, when you think about going into a house, as cliche as that is, and you're like, you know, all the lights are off and like you're trying to figure out how to navigate hallways and bedrooms and doorways. If you've been to that house 10,000 times, you could probably find most of the things in that house. If it's the first time going to the house and it's dark out, you're like, you probably couldn't even open the front door, right? So, so the more that you do this, the more familiar things become. And what I've seen is that a lot of the challenges that we have today, you take the information that you've had and the learning opportunities throughout your life and things start looking oddly familiar, right? I think about 2008, 2009. Right, the, you know, you've got the recession, you've got the housing, you've got bankruptcies, you have just an, a really tragic time in, in, in our world. And there are some similarities today, not the same. They're, the indicators for housing and changes are very different, but inflation and things are getting really expensive for a lot of people where they're having to make some tough decisions about, you know, food, shelter, right? I mean, there's education. I mean, there's a lot of difficult decisions that, that, that a lot of people have to make today, which are similar to where it was in 08, 09. Not the same, very different. The 08, 09 correction was led by real estate. This one isn't led by real estate, right? Back then, rates were you know, going up 10, 12, 14%. People had a lot of predatory loans. I mean, it was, it was, it was a very challenging time. But as you, you use all that information from the past and you take that with you, to create a better experience, to create a better process. And so I would just challenge all of you, wherever you land and your journey, the more information, the more data you have before you make a decision, the better you're gonna be. Now, I've also seen the opposite of that, which is like the getting ready, busy to get ready, get ready, get ready. You're just taking in so much information that all you're doing is getting ready and you don't take action. So there is some sort of balance to that too. It's just a reminder. If you're, if you're a very logical type thinker, like very like, I want to take notes, I want to know everything, there is a point where you actually have to hit go too, yeah. right? So, so you could be in balance or you could be the other side where it's just you're all gas and no research, right? <laughs> so you just run as fast as you possibly can and you've got no data and you've got the other extreme, which is, you know, you're just collecting data, you're collecting data, you're collecting data and you just really don't get to that next level. And so finding some sweet spot for you it's probably a little out of what your natural state is. For me, I'm all gas, I really am, right? So I've had to figure out, okay, where is the middle ground of gathering the information or the information I already have, using that to help make decisions rather than just making decisions and running. You know, it's interesting that you say that. I think about, uh, we used to talk about ready, fire, aim. Yeah. You're going Because most organizations are like, we wanna grow, we wanna do it now, we don't wanna wait. But obviously you don't wanna make mistakes along the way and there's that balance of, What's the right level? The other key thing, uh, and you mentioned quite a few things that were great, um, working through positions in companies where you're going really from the ground up or some way, shape, or form being part of organizations where you go, well, I'm in marketing or I'm in whatever, of understanding all the different areas of a company because you start to see the journey map and the, what the pain points are. So later in the semester, we're gonna be meeting with um, Mike, who's the manager of Costco over in Maplewood, mm -hmm. And he has a really interesting story. He started out pushing carts at Costco in Anchorage, Alaska. And now he's, he's managing the store there. And it's a, you know, a quarter billion dollar store. You go, it's a big piece of business to run. But he talks about how it, he learned things in the cart, pushing the carts and organizing the carts and how people were uh, rewarded and trained and everything. And then other opportunities they had where he worked in every section of the store. He said, if I hadn't had that, I wouldn't understand what it takes to run the store. And more importantly, I wouldn't understand what the customer is looking for of different things, whether it's the carts weren't organized or what the return process was. So as you guys think about career and your final projects, think about not just maybe the final product or service or the job, but what are the things that I can learn along the way and who should I talk to to learn that whole journey map? That will give you a complete experience uh, picture of what it should look like. 
So what are trends that are happening now? Because this is a different world of post-pandemic and inflation and all sorts of stuff happening. And just as you said, you never arrive, which none of us ever do. What things are going on now where you're going, it's a different world of what you're facing than it was two years ago, pre-pandemic, I'll say, yeah, two years ago. Yeah, uh, it's, it's changed a lot. It was already on it. I mean, we're, we're always, right, we're always growing and evolving as a, as, as, a, as a world. But what's interesting is how fast everything changed because of the past several years from a convenience standpoint. Like everyone started, started really using phones and technology to order things, to transact, I mean, from groceries to, I mean, if you look now, people are like, I think it's like 80 something percent are using phones over, over desktop or, or laptop. So it's drastically changed with that. And we were already on this, this path is attention span, span is continuing to decrease, <laughs> right? So it's, it's, it's so fast and quick. And, and, and so when someone needs to make a decision, such as real estate or whatever it may be, if you don't respond within a couple of minutes and they don't, let's say it's not a, you know, someone that's connected to us that we already know, if you don't respond in a couple of minutes, they've found someone else that can help them, right? Especially you take a lot of things that have happened in the world where there's tight inventory and supply yeah. and, there's, and there's higher demand, right? So, so housing, let's just use that. There's less homes for sale and less opportunities. So if you and your family or whatever situation you're in, let's say you have one of those life-changing events where you have to move in the next 30 days. And there are two properties available in the price point, budget, like location, whatever it may be where you are. And both of them sold in five minutes and you lost out. And there are now zero for sale. One pops up two weeks from now on your favorite real estate app or website or wherever that may be. And you call a real estate agent, maybe you know, or, or maybe one that you find online and they don't respond. How long do you wait before you go find someone else that will respond? Not long, not long, right? You're in a situation where you're, you're expecting a kid, right? You're, you're, you're relocating. You're not waiting very long, <laughs> right? You're, you're in a position where like, Hey, I, I don't have, we don't have shelter 30 days from now, right? That's the level of severity of, of the decisions that are made in real estate. There's a lot of industries that are like that too. But that's where we have to be so good with the experience and process with making sure that we are answering the, every call right away, that we are responding to every message, every text message, every email address, every social media message, right? So things have definitely changed a little bit there. The amount of time that we have to get things right is not long. So that's one thing that has changed really quickly. The other thing is, and we were evolving from this, we are, we are leaving more of a sales orientated economy into more of like an education based one, right? No one wants a, a hard sell on anything anymore. Very few people, unless maybe it's a strong, super strong salesperson that appreciates it, but very few people want that, right? They want to be educated. They want information and then they'll make the best decision. Why is YouTube one of the, you know, the, the biggest websites visited in the entire world? Because you can go on there right now and because they're so good with their SEO and, and, and titles and tags. And if you want to say how to do this today, you'd, you'd find a video that would walk you through how to do it today. Pay no money, learn and go. People want information. And so that's a really important piece of it. And for years we have done a significant amount of workshops videos, like we're constantly delivering content and putting information out there in a way that I'd say five years ago, wasn't that popular, right? Why are, why is Chris going to go to university and share anything that anyone asks about marketing and have zero fear about what person in the industry, what potential competitor is watching. That wasn't the way that it used to be. I remember when I got into real estate, you know, in 2009, there was no, I'll tell you right now, no brokers, no agents wanted to share with you, right. right? Everyone was competition. Everywhere you looked, it was a scarcity mindset of like, better not share that information. Cause if they, if you give them that, you, they'll, 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 they'll pass you up or take you over or whatever it may be. Here's what I've learned. No one can beat you. That's the thing. The only race that you're in is with yourself, right? The competition isn't with anyone else. 
So people ask me all the time, like, hey, how do you respond to people that say this? How do you respond to brokerages that say this and do this? We don't even pay attention to them. I, half the time when people ask me questions or things that have been said about us, or I don't even know what they are. Because we are so focused on, we know where we need to go. We're not worried about what anyone else is doing. You see this often where you have a lot of people, and I would say the other big change that's happened in the world, you have a lot of people that have went from playing offense in, in, the, in the business world to playing defense, right? As things have evolved, a lot of companies could not navigate the changes fast, right? We, we have, we have a, a, a marketing agency where people, like a lot of companies came to us and said, we, we were, we're doing what we were doing before and we are no longer connecting with customers. Lead flow is down, branding's down. That story was played over and over and over again. And the reason that that happened is that when you stop innovating, you, I mean, it's over. It is absolutely over. And so you saw this. And so then what then started to happen is a lot of businesses around the world started playing defense. Well, what are they doing over there? Well, what's going on there? Let's go take a look at that. Pretty soon, a lot of companies were focused on other companies in their industry, trying to figure out what the leaders were doing and they were no longer leading. And when you get to that position, I mean, there's lots of historical examples. I mean, you can look at a blockbuster, Netflix. I mean, there's lots of stories of how that, how the, that played out, right? There's, there's plenty of them happening right now in the world. And the minute that you start doing things that you're just, you're not really good at, and you start focusing and looking at what you think things are, and then trying to implement those, you're really in trouble. And I think of like the amount of people that have tried to get in like the guaranteed offer, you know, the branding process space of like the convenience that you see on all of our messaging and branding to the real estate scholarship that we offer people that are non-licensed. Like I've watched so many organizations around the, the, the world try to implement that without the details and what, without the like pull back the curtain, like how does this actually work? And what makes most companies special is the people in the process. It really does. And so you can go out and say, oh, like that looks amazing. I'm going to go put that message out there. But if you don't execute on it, you're not going to be around that long. You know, it's interesting. We in corporate strategies, shameless plug for one of my other courses. Some of you have taken it and most of you have to. Uh, we talk about blue ocean strategy, which is an older concept, but it really is the whole idea. It's a really good book. Of, you know, don't, don't worry about the competition is doing. The competition's irrelevant. And just as Chris was saying, of what can differentiate us into blue ocean uncharted territory? And I think that's a major shift of, of people that are players and then everybody who's in the commodity business. Commodity is always looking to the left or the right. What are they doing? We've got to match it, slightly improve it. Uh, blue Ocean says, let's look at what the customer is looking for and then how do we exceed that? And then we're not going to worry about the competition. You mentioned something about um, you know, innovation, which I think is also key, of constantly innovating. Um, how do you get the ideas for innovation? I mean, you're obviously a key player. You, you're the CEO of the, the organization. How does innovation kind of permeate the whole organization? Because there's only so much that you're going to see yeah, or do. How do you make that happen where that's part of the lifeblood, the DNA of Chris Lindahl? So I think there are several things. The, the people, which I mentioned before, so we have an incredible creative team, right, where there's like a lot of ideation going on. We also do... I believe a really good job of listening to what people say online, right? So the amount of messages that we get on social media, the comments, what people say in the community to employees, agents inside our organization, when people fill out a form on our website, what they put in the body of the message, right? Listening to the words, the things that people are saying, what the conversations that our agents are having inside of homes, right? From someone that's looking to sell their fourth home to someone that's thinking about a first time home buyer that's thinking about their first one, right? Those types of conversations, when you, what you start to find out is that similar mm -hmm. statements and words and things are happening along the way. And all of our greatest ideas, everything that has been just right on market have come from where other people told us to go. Mm -hmm. We didn't create them. We just listened really well, right? And we saw like, hey, here's what people are saying right now, right? I'll give you an example, like when everything you know, if you remember, everything shut down, like everything shut down when, when the pandemic first started, right? Everything was like, all, all of a sudden, everything was just down. I mean, they closed down highways, oh, yeah. right? I mean, it was just yep. done. And so we made a, a, a fundamental shift in our business based on what we saw happening. 
we don't know where we're going. We don't, I mean, no one had any details about what life was going to look like. I mean, it was, it was almost, I felt like overnight, all of a sudden, the world flipped upside down. So what we did is we changed all of our billboards and all of our messaging to no longer about real estate and about giving back to the community and helping people that were in need. Right. And so, so, and these aren't stories that, have, that, that, you know, we went out and told at, you know, at scale all over the, all over the, the Metro, but we, we took a lot of Uber drivers that were now all of a sudden had no business and we went out and bought supplies for, you know, a lot of elderly people that were, that were at risk, that were concerned, that didn't want to leave their condo, didn't want to leave their home, didn't want to leave their senior living facility. And we delivered groceries and supplies and things like that to it. So when we did that, we learned that there were a lot of people that were really scared. We had a lot of houses that were on the market. We had a lot of condos that were on the market. A lot of townhomes are on the market. They're like, hey, hit the pause button, take this off. You know, we, we don't want any showings. We don't want anyone in our house. We don't want any germs. We don't want any, like, all of a sudden the whole thing changed, but it's like, well, if you're not leaving, do you need support in other areas, right? Like in, in the, I mean, the groceries were inundated. People weren't delivering groceries. The grocery stores were changing their rules. Everything was, they didn't have, if you remember, there was no supply, right? I mean, all of a sudden the shelves were gone. There were certain things you couldn't get. So everything was very different, but we, we made a decision like, like, I'd say less than 24 hours into when it really hit, when right when everyone started getting it, it was like when everything shut down, I think they made the announcements that professional sports teams were canceling and all of a sudden it was like off. So we did a, I did a, a in, internal video live stream to our company and said, hey, don't know where we're going, but we really need to just shift our focus and help people. There'll be a day when business is back on and that, you know, we're open for business, but today we gotta, we gotta make sure we're supporting and helping the communities. And so one other thing that as we notice things that are changing, one thing that we've always done well and gets more challenging when you scale is moving quickly, right? So, is, so when you see opportunity and you're like, this is right, you, you have to be able to execute. And it's, you look at the, the larger corporations, you talk about the strategy side, and you, then you get into the liability and all the, the you know, compliance and all the, depending on what industry it is, it can take you longer uh, to execute on things. And sometimes, the amount of effort that you have to put in to actually innovate is too much. So you go, hey, this is a great idea. I'm not even gonna bring it up anymore because this idea is take too much red tape to actually get it to the finish line. And so, so we've made a conscious effort that we, we won't b become that. We can't, because what makes us different is that innovation piece. And if we, if, if, if we can no longer innovate, then the X factor, the thing that made us special is no longer special. And so we have to make sure that's a priority that as complex as the business gets, especially with all the process related people and the structure we've put in place, we have to make sure that we don't lose sight of and focus of what made us different to begin with. And that's being able to innovate quickly. Mm -hmm. Also, it sounds like the speed of doing that is critical. It's, it's the ability yeah. to do it, but it's also not getting bogged down, but it's the speed of turning that around. And I think about Amazon, their two main buildings in, in Seattle are called day one and day two, literally, they're giant buildings. And the reason that Bezos named them that was we, we have to continually act like this is our first day or our second day in business. And you can say Amazon's pretty good at what they do, but the idea of constant innovation, recognizing, rewarding, putting that in place and doing it quickly. Um, do you have things, and, and I, I don't know how else to bring this up for you going, you know, we're gonna try some things, they probably don't work and that's okay. Because I think one of the yeah. other fears is, and I'll say it from an academic standpoint of, we all wanna get A's, you know, why wouldn't we? And business, we always want to succeed, and that doesn't always happen. I think of the things that I tried in business where you go, it was a complete failure, and did I learn out of it? Yes, and thankfully I had bosses who were going, you know what, we're not gonna can you today, maybe tomorrow, but uh, keep trying. How do you learn from failures, and do yeah. you kind of not reward them, but with innovation, you don't always hit the ball the first time. How do you manage that yeah, whole process? Yeah, I, I don't think you ever hit the ball the first time. <laughs> At least no. in my experience, nope. it's been very difficult to do that. I think, actually, I think about my, my journey through college, right? The, the, I don't remember all the A's that I got. I mean, I was a fairly decent student. I wasn't a 4.0 student, but I remember the courses that I struggled through. I don't actually remember the, I mean, I could list all, I could list all the courses like, that was really tough. I, it was really challenging. The ones where I got like A's or, you know, or, or close to it, I don't have the same level of remembrance from that as I do the ones where I struggled. And it's the same thing in, in business. There are things that I've done along the way that we got really, that we, we got right out of the gate. 
I don't probably not going to tell that story today, right? Because it's not as interesting as the ones where it's like, for example, the arms out billboard, we had three billboards before that, that no one remembers. They were terrible. Like they were awful. And no one ever asked that question. Like they always ask like, Hey, what does arms out mean? What about the arms out billboard? Why are you on billboards? How do they work? And the other thing that also everyone thinks the billboards are what built the brand, but no one asks about the direct mail where we sent it to entire cities or the, or the 10 radio stations or the SEO or the pay-per-click or the digital or all that became way before the billboards. The billboards were the last thing, right? We were already really mature company before we decided to get into billboards yet. The, the, the sort of illusion of like what success is like all of a sudden, like people are like, oh, well the billboards are what put Chris Lindahl real estate on the map. Like, well, there was a lot of other things that happened along the way before we got to that point. But it's interesting when you look at what things we connect with as, as, as human beings, like, I mean, a, you know, there's all obviously, you know, through your journey here, you've probably done a lot of different studies on the brain and what things we remember and why and things like that. But there, there is, it's an interesting journey to think about what things work, what things don't work, why we remember things. And, and, and for us, I think, the majority of things that we do, people from the outside would measure and say, we got it wrong. But the amount of information that we learned from it, that is what makes it right. And so if you were to build up in the, and I think one of the other challenges, when you think about the measurement of success and failure, when it comes to some sort of initiative that you take in a business, most people measure that in a short amount of time, right? Hey, if, if I roll out, let's just call it, I rolled a new billboard today and tomorrow everyone in here tells me if it worked or it didn't, right? Instead of tell me if it worked or didn't work three years from now. And I'll give you a lot more information about the other things that, that came along with that billboard that you saw, not buyers and sellers, not recruits, but maybe it's the way that people feel about our brand, right? Things that you, that, that are tangible, but you can't quite measure those, you know, 24 hours. And I think a lot about sales conversion rates, right? So today, let's say that uh, 200 people go to chrislandell.com and fill out our guaranteed offer form. If tomorrow you wanted to know what the results were of all of those people in the guaranteed offer program, it would look pretty bleak. Odds are we actually probably weren't, our, our sales team probably didn't even get inside most of those homes 24 hours from now. If you measure it three months from now, it's still probably pretty bleak. Right? You get people that reach out, they're like, I'm six months out, I'm gonna be retiring in the future, I, we've got a due date of a child that's gonna be in six months, 10 months, 12 months, whatever it may be. It, so, it's, it, so, it, so then you measure it six months, 12 months, 18 months, and you keep going. If you, every little bit inch further out you go, every couple of days, months, the better it becomes. And the challenge I would say that I find in most people that are getting into business in the, in the early days, and that could be on the corporate side, entrepreneur side, it could be your own business. What I see happen is that everyone's looking to measure things way too soon, right? I see in sales, for example, you get a new agent, a new real estate agent that gets into the industry, especially the last couple of years, it's been tough, right? There's no inventory. You're bringing home buyers to houses. They're losing out in multiple offers over and over again. It's a lot of challenging times. It might take 10, 20, maybe 50 houses to find one that gets accepted. That's what it's been. Okay, if you measure the amount of effort that you put in to the amount of income that you receive on that one transaction, you'll quit. You will, you'll quit, you'll quit. But if you measure the relationship, the friendship, the bond that you formed in that first client meeting to all the way to closing, and you measure it one year, two years, five years, 10 years, what you start to find is over time, as long as you do your job right, right, and you invest and you, and you I mean, it's people first, not, not business first, if you do your job right, what you're gonna find is two years from now, you're like, you know what, that one transaction, I've got 10 referrals from that person. I've got invited on family trips with that person. We go to church together, we study together, we raise our kids together, we go to sporting events together, we celebrate together, we win together, whatever. All of a sudden, the, all the other benefits of anything that happens are further out. The challenge is in the world today, when you look at it as a society of the different personality types, the majority of people don't have high vision. That doesn't make it wrong. The majority of people in the world don't have high vision, so they can't see what, the, what a, a marketing initiative or what 
something that wasn't quite right that happened today, they can't see 12 months, 24 months, five years down the road, what that one thing will do for them later. All they can see is what it is today. Like that didn't go well, that was really bad, right? Let's not do that again. And you might be 24 months down the road and you're like, I'm so glad that we had that opportunity a couple of years ago where we tried that, it didn't work because now we just created a world-class experience from that one moment. Yeah. But, you, but if you don't go at it from, a, from that, that big vision perspective, you'll quit every single time because a lot of the results that we get initially, I should have quit buying billboards after billboard number two, where I was like, this is really <laughs> bad. I remember the, the one like where we did is we took nine pictures of me, right? So we took nine pictures in different outfits stacked across a billboard. And it was like, I sell a home every nine hours, right? It was just nine different things. No one cared. No one cared that I sold a house every nine hours, right? So, so, but I thought like, oh, this is creative. There's going to be nine of me on a billboard. Everyone's going to love it, right? And then the other one was like the, the traditional suit and tie, formal wear, like here's the next realtor. Like I'm just a little bit younger version of everyone else you've seen on bus benches, <laughs> right? So it's like the same thing. Like you have to be able to differentiate yourself and the way to do that is learning from the things that don't go right. Well, the other thing I think on the learning too, and this is particularly, I, I wish that many of my bosses had had that philosophy because as the marketing guy, it was like, you just spent a bunch of money, what are the results? What are the results? Yeah. What are the, and it was yeah. easy to go, well, the payback isn't quite there yet, so we're gonna reduce whatever it is just about the time yeah. you might be getting something going. And I, a, a key thing, I think especially as it relates to experience is, so many of the elements, as we think about the journey map, the touch points, Chris, that you mentioned, it isn't one thing, it's a, it's a whole series of things that are happening that create that trust. It's not just the billboard, as you said, it's not just the response time, it's all of those things working together, which individually may be a small part, but collectively is why someone puts their trust in it and goes, hey, let's go on vacation together, let's go to church together, all of those other things. So as we think about the journey, the, the journey map, and each one of those points, you're probably, as you're doing your final projects, you're not gonna come up with this is the major thing. It's what are all those steps along the way and how can I personalize them? We've talked a lot about the personalization. When you look at you know, how things are doing, do you look at, is it numerical? Is it more qualitative? Is it a combination of things? Because I think a lot of people go, what's the number, it's up or down, and that's success or failure. And sometimes at the expense of, you know, there's some softer material in there, but when you really dig into it, you're going, that's trending positive, that's trending negative. How do you evaluate kind of between those two realms? So there's a lot of different ways to do that, right? So there's the internal yeah. side of like, what are we doing well? What, what you know, so that like the feedback loop system of like, what should we start doing? What should we stop doing, right? And what should we continue doing? Yeah. So just asking some basic questions like that. What are we are we on the right path? Are we serving you? Yeah, you know I mean, are we serving you at the level that you that you need to be served at? Like, so you're asking a lot of those different types of questions. So that's more like of an internal. Externally, I mean, I think the big one that's been around for a lot of corporations as of more recent is CSAT score, right? So some sort of net promoter CSAT NPS score. If the, I don't know how, how familiar everyone here is with that, but some sort of score of how did we do, and and that could be at different touch points of a transaction. That could be, I mean, I, I mean, I remember going through, you know, the, the Atlanta Georgia airport and there's a smiley face or a sad face on a button that you push when you grab paper towels in the bathroom, right? It's either, you're either happy or sad about the experience. That's it, one or the other. And I've seen other ones with like Delta Airlines, like, hey, hold on the line after you book your airfare to press one through 10, how likely are you to hire the, the, the representative if you were running a business that you just talked to, right? So you, you leave a number. So there's a lot of different ways to, to measure that. And, and for us, like we use a, a very basic system. It's, it's zero, one, or two. So we give them three options. Two, we knocked it out of the park. One was average and zero, something really, you know, they were really unsatisfied, right? And so, so I think that, that the challenge with the review system in general is skewed now, right? Because anyone can go write a review at any time and they might not be a customer. They might, there, there could be whatever reason they want and, and there's just not, the barrier to entry to leave public reviews is too low, right? There's no way to validate it. It's unless you get to like, you know, companies like Angie and things like that where they vet the customer to make sure the customer actually transacted or, or had experience with you. 
But when you look at like the Facebooks and the Googles, or anyone can go on there and leave a review whenever they want, right? right? And so, so, and it's too far down in the process to be able to step in and, and make things better or, 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 or praise someone internally because the experience has been great or identify parts of the process that are working super well or areas that need improvement. A review, especially in real estate, we might have someone that registered on our website 12 months ago and we don't get a review from them for maybe another 18 months, yeah. depending on how, you know, where they're at in the journey of thinking about buying and selling. But if we measure on phone call number one, on message number one, on meeting number one, and we measure like, how did we do today? There, we, we have a lot more visibility into our business about where we can, you know, things that we should keep doing, things we should stop doing, and things that we should think about doing, right? So those are, those are for us, the numbers are what lead us to that point. But then there's other things too that you can measure on, on, on a sales organization like conversion rates. Like say, hey, when we set an appointment, how often does this agent get to the home face to face? Because we know if, if someone reaches out to us and takes intent and goes through all the steps to get a hold of us, they're thinking about buying or selling a house. Although I will tell you that anyone that we meet with always says they're not, right? Because <laughs> there's something human in, instinctively in us that we don't want to feel like we're stepping into a major commitment <laughs> or that we're like going to give our house away or we're going to spend too much money. So you show up to the house and the homeowners say, no, we don't have to sell. Right, and they're doing all this work to the house and things are getting packed up. Like, no, we're good, we don't have to move. So I think there's sort of like that bluff at times that, that people put out there. But we know that when someone comes to, reaches out to our brand, we have to get in front of them. Not because we're trying to convert them into new business or a sale, because we have to be able to effectively help them. And if someone is navigating life and thinking about selling or buying a home and they haven't done it in 20 years, and, we, and, and they reach out to us, and it ends up with one of our agents, and our agent doesn't get in front of them, we've done a disservice to the customer, right? And so our goal is like, we, gotta, we have to get in front of that customer as soon as we possibly can to give them the right information so that they can make the best decision for themselves and their family. Yeah. And that's what our motivation is to get there. Yeah. And so there are different data points that you can have along the way where you might have an agent that, let's just say, and, and I'm not saying this is happening in our organization, but it could be anywhere, just hypo hypothetically speaking, that maybe it's going through a tough time in life. Maybe there's a few days where they're feeling like, you know, I just really don't have it. They had some appointments set, they decided to reschedule them, something came up, there was a conflict in the calendar, and for some whatever reason, this person reached out to, you know, family reached out to our brand and then we didn't end up at the home. We have data points that if that happens, we then can, we can proactively reach out to the customer and say, hey, we dropped the ball here we're gonna have someone else come out and we, have, we apologize, we're gonna make the experience better. Doesn't happen in our organization, but the reason it doesn't happen is because we're keeping score in all these metrics. Now, some people would say that working in that type of environment, it feels like a lot of structure, it feels maybe slightly corporate, it feels like micromanagement, but we don't have a choice because the customer is counting on us in one of the most stressful times of their life. We have to show up and deliver. And I think a lot about the transition from, you know, when you're, when you're for people that have, that have played sports throughout their life and you're, you're very young playing sports and there's no scoreboard. Even though all the parents and the sidelines are still <laughs> keeping score and they tell the kids after the game, here's what the score was, yeah. even though there's no, it's not publicly displayed. And then, as you, and then as, you, as you get older, then scoring and stats and all that stuff becomes way more visible than it did when you were younger. And then when you get into life and bit, grades, become, you mentioned A's, I mean, that stuff, start, you start, there starts to be measurement of things. And it's the same thing in an organization. When you're running an organization and it's complete chaos and no one knows what they're held accountable to or what they're supposed to do, a lack of standards, that organization isn't gonna be around very long, right? And the reason they're not gonna be, able, not gonna be around very long isn't how the leader feels, anyone in the organization feels, it's the customers no longer want to work with that brand. And it's understanding metrics. I, I mean, I think businesses tend to go, what are our sales? What are our costs of sales? Whatever the financial metrics are, but breaking it down again into the journey map of along the way, where is value perceived? So you know, having worked a long time in the restaurant business, you're going, it started well before someone ever got in and ordered food. It might be in the parking lot. Was the parking lot clean? Or you're going, well, it, you know, there might've been something around there. Once they got inside, the service was great, the meal was great. 
But if the parking lots were dirty, and we did this when I was part of Pepsi, where you go and fill out evaluations about the parking lot, which seemed a little bit weird, but we found out over time of if it was slightly dirty, sometimes people would turn around and drive out. I mean, it sounds like an obvious thing of yeah. pick up the parking lot and make it clean, but it's really the food that's important. That's table stakes, pun intended. It's all understanding all of these metrics along the way and measuring them yeah. and putting a value against them, which change things. Um, thinking forward to um, uh, something where you go, it's a slower cycle in the business that you're in and people generally aren't buying or selling homes multiple times a year for the most part. How important is the follow-up after the sale is done? Yeah. Because you could look at it and go, okay, done, they're happy, you're happy, and then we're on to the next customer. Is that a critical part of what you do? It is. So, in, in, yeah, it is. In, yeah. in real estate, they call that like your sphere of influence, right? So that's the people around you. It could be coworkers, friends, family, past clients, current clients. Might be just people that you've attended, you know, vacation with or sure. you met along the way in sports. Like someone that you know where you have their information, they know who you are, right? So you have the sphere of influence that some people send out newsletters, digital newsletters now. They call every quarter. They might drop off little small gifts, send, th you know, little things out to you. So those things matter a lot. But what matters even more than that is understanding how each of your customers want to be communicated with or each person in your database, which is another way that it would be referred. Like, do they want to get an email from you every single day when they're not buying another house for 10 years? Right, do they want to get a text message every four hours about new listings that are hitting the market when they bought a house last month? Right, so understanding that, because there is a, a, a message to market conversation. I think what you just said there is really important. It's the, it's like, it's the where are those pain points, right, of like, how many of you have been, you know, signed up for some service or product and you start getting newsletters that you don't want and you hit unsubscribe, right? That type of thing. And so that's hard at scale too, right? To tr understand like, okay, each of our customers, you know, see, feel, act and see, look at the world all different, right? And so trying to figure out like, how do we deliver value to each customer or each past customer, people in our database or sphere of influence, how do we deliver to them where we're not annoying? right, where we're not bothering them. And it's super difficult, but what, you, what you'll find, and especially in a downturn of like a ch shifting market, you'll find a lot more conversations about the, how powerful having a database or you know, your customer list that you've been active with and connected with. Because the, the, the part that you save on when from, a, from a business expense standpoint in a downturn, a lot of companies, will cut back on marketing when they have a really healthy, strong database because they don't have the same customer acquisition cost on someone that's already in their database. Not that there's not an expense to servicing you know, that relationship, but it's very different than going out and having to earn the business for the first time. And so you'll see a lot of organizations, usually typically a lot smaller than ours, that will, that will just work their small database and that's what they'll do. You've, you probably know a real estate agent that, that, that you're familiar with that's been in the industry for a very long time and they do no marketing and no branding and they sell you know, a decent amount of houses and they have a comfortable living. It's because they're working off of that same list that they've had and then you get the generational type referrals where you know, the grandparents you know, then referred the realtor to the parents and then the parents referred it to the kids and now the kids referring to the grandkids and next thing you know, the, 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 the real estate agent has sold you know, five generations of houses right, to, to a family. And that's where you see a lot more of that. And so it's, it's super critical, but it's, there's also a balance of making sure that it's right for the customer. I think where, where the mistake is made in a lot of smaller businesses is they try to make the messaging about the business and not about where the customer's at in their life. It's, you know, we keep hearing pain points again and again, and we talk about it all the time in class. Of That's a key thing. When you can reduce those things, beginning, during, end, it's better for all of us when you think about you know what makes a great experience. Uh, I didn't have friction anywhere along the way. So we've talked about Amazon. I had a friction point with them the other day of I had been in the habit of I had to return something, it was the UPS store, it was no charge, and it's two minutes away from my house where you're going, just made it really easy, you drop it off there, loved it. Had to return something the other day and it was like, you have to go to Kohl's or you have to pay money. And it was like, wait a minute here, all of a sudden my value equation of Amazon went down. I'm like, for a year and a half, I've been returning something if I need to at UPS, convenient, no nothing, and now I gotta go all the way over to Kohl's, which is inconvenient, 
or I got to pay five bucks to do it somewhere else where you're going, they was returning it. It was on the other end of it, but you're going, you know what, maybe I should just go buy it from the store here next time. So those pain points and, and looking at that and making something convenient is really critical. Now I've done something I said I wouldn't do and you're going, yeah, we're really surprised by this, Donaldson. I've talked for almost an hour here. What questions do we have in the class? Because I could go on, Chris and I could be here maybe until tomorrow, so my apologies for violating that once again. But questions from the class of Chris or anything we've heard about so far? So Judy touched a little bit upon like ages in your company versus like solopreneurs and like different agencies versus like more of a team based approach. Mm -hmm. Like could you talk about how is that, how is a team different from a solopreneur or how is it like the transition, for example, how it went from like the dining room to the principal building? Yeah. So, it, well, it, it, this would be every traditional brokerage, but it, there's a couple, depends on from whose eyes, right? So if it's from a customer's eyes or if it's from an agent joining the brokerage, I think we just said there's, let's say an agent's coming from another brokerage that they were working for. Now all of a sudden, when they join our company, they, they are responsible for a lot less things and they are gonna be focused on meeting the customers where the entire, think about the entire back end operations of running a business, we handle all of that for them. So it's a, the best way to describe it would be if you were going on vacation and you decided that, you, let's say you're a bargain type traveler, right? Where you want to look online for the cheapest rate for planes, hotels, like you're flexible on dates, times, you're like, I just want the best deal. And then someone else travels and like, I want all inclusive, I want everything taken care of for me, I don't care what it costs, right? So in our organization, we're the all inclusive brokerage, right? So when someone comes in, Everything is taken care of for them. You want to eat here, you want to do this, you want this person to do that, like, we got it, no problem, we'll take care of it. Whereas on the, on the, the other side, like that more bargain type, you know, traveler, like you're responsible for like, hey, if you go to meet a customer today at a traditional brokerage and they say, I want aerial photography, you have to go out and find a, a, a drone pilot to go fly that drone. If they say, what's your strategy for direct response social media ads? You have to, if you're an individual agent, you have to go find someone or you have to have that ability or skill set to go and create direct response copywriting. Then you have to go back into the in sort of ads manager of whatever social media platform. You have to create the ads. You then have to, let's say that the customer says, well, I've never seen it. Why have I never seen the ads? You then have to go in and look at all the analytics and show them like, well, here's how many customers we've reached. Here's the frequency cap, impressions, whatever, whatever they want to know. You then have to articulate all that. Right, so let's say they say, we don't like the photography, like the photos that we think are terrible. You as an individual agent, if you're at a traditional brokerage, you have to go find another photography company that you probably have to come out and meet with and say, hey, they didn't like this room. Let's say that they say, we didn't like the staging, like the house, it just doesn't look great. Like I'm looking online, I'm not satisfied with my listing. You have to then go out there and restage it if you have some sort of certification in that, or you have to go find another home stager that will go out to the home and position the house the way that they want it, right? So it's a, it's a very different type of, of business model. And I would say most people that are in traditional real estate don't even understand what we do. They just fundamentally don't because when you've done the same thing for so long, you feel like, hey, how many different ways are there to sell a home? Now, I just gave quick five examples off the top of my head. Those are, those are two very different business models of who owns what level of risk and responsibility. Right, so, they're, so they're, they're very different depending on, you know, and, but also what you find too is that when you look at a P&L in business, and, and let's say you were at that traditional brokerage and you're looking to go somewhere else, one of the things that's rarely in the evaluation process of a P&L of like, I'm taking my business from that traditional brokerage over to team-based brokerage at KLRE. When you look at the P&L of the differences and let's say compensation percentages of, uh, and, you know, and, and evaluate risk and all the other things that matter, in terms of responsibility and in your life, rarely do people put a line item for time, right? And the ability to move faster because someone has already done something or learned something or went through the mistakes of those learning opportunities, that element of time, I'm telling you, becomes one of the biggest priorities of your life, right? All of a sudden you're like, well, I've got a lot of success going on, I've got a lot of income coming in, but I have zero time for anything. So now all of a sudden you're like, okay, how do I, you know, and obviously there's probably, uh, you know, people are probably looking for a little bit of both, right? So there's some middle ground, right? It's like, okay, at KLRE, I work 40% less than I do in a traditional brokerage, 
right? That's attractive to me. But to someone else, maybe they're first getting started, they're willing to work 100 hours a week. I only wanna work 50, right? So there becomes different motivating factors to why you wanna do things. Maybe the priority is, hey, when I go into an appointment, I wanna know that the customer that I'm working with is getting the best experience, and I believe in a team-based brokerage where we have specialists in every single department, I believe that they're gonna get a better experience than me being at a traditional brokerage, showing up by myself, over-promising and under-delivering on things that I can't execute on, right? So those are some of the factors if that answered your question. Great, who Jeremiah? else? Yeah. So, okay, so you, when you're saying different teams. So like sales Different team, departments, yeah, like different departments. Team, yeah. yeah, different departments. Yeah. So one of the things that, that I think is super important in, in business is when everyone is running on the same system, right? The same terminology. For example, John and I could end up working together 10 years down the road and John ex is experiences in life if we don't have a, 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 a formal structure in place, John's terminology could be very different than mine. We could be saying the same thing and we'd have no idea. It'd feel like we're talking two different languages, but we're ultimately going, the same, the, going to the same place together. So making sure that you have like the same structure across the board is super important. That way, then, all, then everyone is speaking the same language, right? And, that's, and so that we have that in place. Also, I think a thing that matters too is having department level scorecards. Right, and, and as we've grown, I would say that there's some departments where we've had scorecards that maybe weren't the priorities in the business. And there's a couple different ways that people look at that. You have your KPIs, right, that you, you hear all the time, key performance indicators, and those are one part of it, right? But the KPIs, in a lot of cases, those are things in the past, right? Those are things that have already happened. For example, closed home sales. That already happened, if it closed today, all the work that we had to do happened months ago. And then what you have is leading indicators, like where are you going, right? So leading indicators would be someone came to chrislandell.com today and wanted a guaranteed offer. Someone came to realestatescholarship.com and was interested in a career in real estate. Those would be leading indicators because they filled out the form today and we know if we get, I'm just making this up, if we get 200 people that apply today or fill out our form today, we know based on our, our metrics in the business, K past KPIs play a factor in that and figuring that out. We know that 30 days from now, the business is gonna be here. We know 90 days from now, the business is gonna be here. But if our leading indicators drop or go up or whatever it is, we know the business down the road is gonna be impacted from that. And so having that information, now when you scale, what you've mentioned there, when you scale and evolve, as you start getting down the road, you start realizing that the scorecard you had no, is no longer the same one that you need as you grow. Right, so there's an evolution to that as well, where you're at, you're at one point, you're, you're like, okay, this is what we need to know, and then you're three months down the road, and you look at the scorecard, and you're like, I don't think we need any of those numbers, <laughs> we need numbers over here, right? And that's that sort of ongoing journey of evolving. And then also, the, the economics change, the, the world changes, and you go, these were a priority, but I'm not sure all of them are a priority anymore, because now the business looks like this, right? And so, so it constantly evolves, but having those open conversations to, to, to move the business is critical. Jeremy, I can remember when I was at LifeTouch, uh, we had a change in management and we had so many reports on certain things that we looked at and the new CEO coming in was to take me through all of these things and it was like, okay, why do we have these, why do we have these, why do we have these? And what came out of it was a conversation with everybody, half of them we didn't need anymore. We're going, things have changed and yet probably for six months we had continued to generate them, look at them, try to act on them, going, I'm not even sure it's the right indicators anymore, which yeah. I think there was a key message of sometimes you get in the habit of doing things in a business and because there's so many things going on and it operates so quickly, you just keep doing them until someone goes, why are we doing this? And there's that you know, uncomfortable yeah. pause and because we already have, now let's just get at it. And you're going, no, wrong thing to do. So yeah. that openness on maybe they're valuable, but question them and be willing to change on them is really critical. You also see too that you know, when an organization grows, I think this is, this is a really a, a critical point I would say, share with everyone. When a business grows and scales, it creates way more opportunities, mm -hmm. right? As departments evolve and, and, and there's, there's just, there's an abundance of opportunities. At the same time, there's also a risk for doing things the way that you've always done them, 
And so all of a sudden, you can be in a position in a growing organization. I've seen this all over the world. I've had opportunity to be, spend a lot of time in a lot of different organizations that I've consulted, speak, and coach with. And what you'll find is that there sometimes are a, a select number of people they are like, well, this is the way we've always done it, or let's just do this. And the suggestions that they're giving are based on the past, not based on where you are going, right? So it's, it's so, but it also become, comes with desire. Some people have a growth mindset and want to grow and want to elevate and want to just get to that next level. Other people are more status quo, a little bit more, I'd say, starting to shift from drive into neutral. Like, hey, I just don't have the desire to run at this level or speed. And, and just making sure that as you're going, navigating life that way, that becomes a big part of this, right? If you want to grow, you have to, obviously, first you have to show up in a growth mindset yourself, but you have to be in an organization that has a runway that's set up to grow, yeah. right? If you're in an organization where you're capped and you don't, and you have a growth mindset, you're going to, you're going to become frustrated and you're going to feel like, you know, you're not going to that next level. But when you're in that position of whether you're, you know, you're in that, you know, Hey, I'm just kind of trying to slow down a little bit, take it easier. Or you're like, I'm on fire. I want to hit the gas pedal. You also have to be willing. And I think it's a big part of this. And that's why I'm such a proponent of team sports. I, I grew up playing sports. You have to be willing to be coachable. So you have to take constructive feedback well. Otherwise, your natural ability caps out at some point, all of you, including myself, right? You have to be willing to take criticism, feedback, face adversity, and do something positive with it. Some people, they get that feedback. Maybe it's, you thought you were getting an A in his class and you're getting a C, right? And so do you blame him or do you go, hey, I haven't committed the right, you know, I haven't committed the right level of time to, to, to get my grades to where they should be. And everyone responds differently to that. Sometimes as we're growing, you know, I would say in the early days that, you know, you get a little more, you'd think that it's someone else's fault or <laughs> some other company's fault. And then as you grow, you start really like, hey, the only one that can change this outcome is me, yeah. right? I look in the mirror, I wake up every day, I'm the only one that can change my path. And I just wanna share that with you because I think that becomes a really important piece of all of this. And that's that idea of continual learning. I mean, Chris obviously knows a ton about the real estate business and yet I sense of, always open to new ideas and what worked today may not work tomorrow. So be continual learners of, you know, not only in an academic environment, but in your jobs, careers, families, um, you know, what are the things that you can continue to learn and get better on? That's also going to be a lot more fun than when you just repeat the same old things again and again and again. Um, before we close out, Chris, any final words of just general wisdom? You've covered a lot I, of really I good know. stuff. Yeah. Any, and, any words of wisdom for upcoming graduates here? Uh, I mean, I, th I think the, the, as I think about, you know, I mean, remember when I was in your seat, I mean, it feels like not that long ago, <laughs> I'm, I'm 40 now. I mean, it, I mean, people tell you and it never really hits home how fast things go, right? Yeah. Oh, it does. I, I remember when I was like sitting in your seat in college thinking like, like, what are they talking about? Like, I'm just like hanging out, doing whatever, <laughs> I'm in control of my own destiny, whatever. And it, and it, and it, does, go, it does go faster than you think. I would tell you that you know where I'm at in, in in business. I really have very few things figured out, right? And so and so the more that you can be a lifelong learner, continual learner, like uh, John had mentioned, I, the better you're going to be. It's going to serve you super well in your life. I think one thing that I've found is that more people in the world today have, have this like know-it-all type mindset, right? I see it so often in the world, and I would just challenge you that. You might have a lot of things figured out, but you also have a lot of things that you still have to learn. When you show up into the business world, wherever, wherever you land, make sure you don't become that person that's like, oh yeah, I've got this, I've got that. One of the most powerful things that you can do, and it takes time to learn and grow and do, is be so good at asking questions. So good. Everywhere you go, become obsessed with it. Like, and it's not question number one, it's multiple levels. Question number one is, you know, the surface level question. But when you get the answer to that, it's like, oh, tell me more. Like, oh, what about this? Like get deep with the questions and go on a fact finding mission in every conversation, every meeting that you're in and take that information with you to make better decisions in the future. When it could be a job interview, could be meeting with a client, could be meeting with your team, could be meeting with your family, friends, spouse, partner. I mean, this all aspects of life it's just so important that, that we start asking more questions. One of the tendencies that most people in the world have today is that everyone's talking so much, right? You notice everyone's talking over the top of each other and it's, it's, all of a sudden it's just like constant chatter. 
I think the other thing that is, you know, that is really important, and one observation that I've made since I've been here today, is that no one's looked at their phone, right? And that's a really important piece of this too, is that when you're in a environment with other human beings and being present and, and connecting is really powerful, right? It's, it's just, it's such an important piece. And it's not that I'm trying to be, you know, old school of like, oh, you gotta have communication, you gotta have connections, but it matters. And it especially matters as you're, as you're going through life. There's a lot of people that you're gonna meet along the way that could change your life but if you're not present in that moment, you might not get that opportunity again. Yeah. And so making sure that you go into every single meeting, every single class, every single thing that you do, knowing that you're one conversation away from changing your life, mm -hmm. right? And, and I know it's like what I said earlier about the vision piece, you might not know what that conversation is or who that person is. You may have not met that person yet. You may have already. Maybe you know it, maybe you don't. You might not know for five to 10 to 15 years, your life might take a turn a different way than you thought it was going to. You might end up in a different industry. You might end up in a different state, a different country, different world. I mean, things could change drastically from where you're at today to, to where you are five years from now. But you might need, you might need John. There might be something that happens in your life where it might, you might have a connection to a place that he worked at before. There might be uh, you know, something that he took a deep dive in this class that you're now seeing and you've got to prepare for a big speech, a big meeting, a big conversation. Like you just don't know where these things are going to land. And just the last quick thing I'd say is just don't burn any bridges along the way, right? That's a really important piece of this because they stay burnt, right? And so a lot of the people that I've met along the way in my life, I'll tell you because of the growth that we've had and the things that we've done, there are so many people that have come back into my life that I have not talked to or seen for a very long time. Last night, I had someone that I went to college with that sent me a message, a very long message, responded, went back and forth with. She, she, she lives in another state, right? She's, she's in another industry, another profession, was asking for some advice, some things that I've seen along the way in, in, in my line of work. She said, I realize you're in a very different industry, but I followed along, I followed your journey. You know, I, I've, I've read your books, I've, I watch your, listen to your podcast, I've watched your videos. Like, I I'm starting to recognize that there are a lot of similarities in almost every industry. And so she just asked for, do you have any advice for me? Here's where I'm at, here's the work that I've done. And it's amazing how that comes full circle as you grow through life. And you end up with friends and mentors and all these different people along the way. And I just wanna share with you that you just don't know what some of these relationships are gonna do for your life right now, yeah. right? And it's, sometimes it's hard when you're sitting in this chair here today, like your priorities and your focus is very different than where it will be five, 10 years down the road. And there, there were a lot of things that I was like, when I was in that, when I was in classes like this, where I didn't realize where my life was actually going, yeah. right? I was like, I'm just trying to graduate here, get done, right? And then you graduate and then you have that few months and you're like, now what? I've spent all this time in education <laughs> and here I am. Do I go get more education? Do I go get a job? How do I start? Like, it can become kind of overwhelming. And what I found is the people that I had met along the way, they were big assets in helping me grow. Like, where should I go? I need help. I've never been to a job interview like this with a college degree. You know, I'm now submitting a job application and there's 700 people applying with the same resume, the same cover letter and, and the same degree. Now what? Yeah. Right? So those things and what you find and, and what I've seen is it, what mattered was who you knew. Yeah. Uh, and as much as anyone wants to tell you like, hey, submit your stuff and we'll evaluate them. I've seen more often than not that all of a sudden, you know, instructor like John, or maybe it's someone that, that, that met me says, Hey, I noticed on LinkedIn that you, we have some mutual friends and I've had some conversation with you. Would you be willing to send a letter of recommendation or reach out via phone or email? And then all of a sudden you're face to face and then it, then it is up to you. But there's just a lot of things that you can do in life with the connections that you make. And I just want to make sure that you take those seriously and you don't take those moments for granted. And just on the other side of it, you also have, you know, there's a, a limited amount of time that everyone here has, right? And so if you go into things and you don't go in with a full commitment, focused and, and show up for everything, you might have regret later. You might have regret in like, I wish I would have taken that class. I wish I would have gave more effort. I wish I would have asked that question. I wish I would have said this. Like you don't want to end up in a spot where later, where there's things that you could have done differently, where you're wishing that it looked a different way later. And on that last piece with relationships, one thing that my wife taught me uh, that I've done ever since for, for decades now is, what are the questions you wanna ask somebody? 
well, we're just going out to dinner with them and it's a casual dinner. It's like, yeah, but what do you want to learn about them? Like, make it purposeful. And I'm like, okay, well, this is creating stress here now. All of a sudden, it went from <laughs> something enjoyable to now where I've got an assignment. But done the right way, we're going, I learn more about other people, even if it had nothing to do with business, because of that intentionality of I'm going to be with them. Why not learn from them? I even found when I used to travel all the time, like, I have no idea who I'm going to sit next to 99% of the time on a plane. What are the questions that I want to ask them? And it might be cues, but not just to kind of, you know, ignore them. As long as they were willing to engage, we're here for two hours or three hours or whatever it is on a plane, learn something. And those have also resulted in relationships where you go, okay, we should stay connected because you do this or you know this person. And if without that intentionality of, of learning, it never would have happened. Chris, I, we started consumer behavior. I think you covered off like half of life situations <laughs> here, which was fantastic. But can we give Chris a round of applause for our so time and wisdom? Thank you. Um, that was fantastic. Thank you so much. Yeah, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank and you. guys, thanks for being a great class. Um, you know, take these things. When you think about projects, obviously immediate applications, and we talk about pain points and journey points, a lot of things that Chris mentioned, which I think will be very useful to you. Much bigger perspective is on life, the learning and the things that you, people you connect with all along the way. There's a reason why you connect with somebody that God gives us. There are no such things as coincidences. We know that God controls everything. What are those purposes? God, what do you want me to learn? Why am I meeting this person today? Um, don't take any of those things for granted. Uh, what can I learn from them? How can I serve coming out of them? So hope you guys enjoy the rest of the afternoon. Have a great Thank weekend. You. We'll see you in class on Tuesday. That was super. Thank you.